I need to share chapter two. And um, we've got today and what is today? Thursday. We got today and Tuesday to cover this material. So we don't have to get in a big hurry. So let me share the PowerPoints. There we go. Let's make a slideshow out of it. All right. Now I want to. Uh, let me minimize that. I want to see myself because then I can tell. There we go. I can tell that I'm writing on the board and it's showing up. Um, if ever you don't see something that I've shared, speak up because somebody else might be having the same problem. But I've shared chapter two PowerPoints. And there we go. I think that's right. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I heard another dingling. Let me see who that was. Well, I'm only missing one. Sometimes if you lose your connection and you jump back into the meeting, it'll ding and I, th I think there's somebody new coming on. <clears throat> okay. Um, chemistry has a history, you know, <laughs> just, like, just like anything else. Things don't happen all at once. They tend to progress over time and especially in the sciences because of the way the accumulation of knowledge and the understanding that develops around it and the explanations for why things happen, those tend to accumulate over time. Um, believe it or not, the Greeks were, were, were really interested in, in chemistry. Um, they may not have called it chemistry at that time, but um, they noticed how things changed and tried to explain it. And they actually came up with an atomic theory, which was expanded upon by uh, uh, John Dalton several centuries later. Uh, between the ancient Greeks and modern chemistry, which started kicking in about the 17th century, middle of the 17th century, um, we had basically alchemy was was the ruling class on the manipulation of substances to get them to change from one thing to another. Um, and alchemists were, were sort of, I don't know, they were kind of a weird mix of uh, spiritualism and uh, uh, practical ambitions. In fact, Isaac Newton was an avid alchemist. Um, and they when they wrote about things, they tended to be cryptic sometimes. The, the goal was not clarity. The goal was to uh, enrich yourself, actually. But you didn't, want to, you didn't want to disseminate your information to too many people because you didn't want competitors. So alchemists usually had apprentices. And the apprentice was privy to everything that alchemist knew. And only occasionally would two alchemists exchange information, which is really quite a change. Once modern science started kicking in, um, it was just the opposite. Modern science took the attitude that the more people that knew what you were doing, the better. The, the additional brain power that was brought to bear on a problem was more likely to solve it. Anyway, <clears throat> by the time modern chemistry came around, several elements had already been discovered. We had identified uh, pure substances and elements, that is, those pure substances that could not be reduced any further by physical means, or chemical means, for that matter. The only way you can reduce an element any further is by nuclear means. 
Um, the alchemists were pretty good at um, concentrating and using mineral acids. Their three favorites were uh, sulfuric acid, nitric acid, and hydrochloric acid. And they could get very concentrated solutions of that. And that, and that stands to reason because it takes those strong acids to dissolve metals. Okay, so uh, modern chemistry started coming in about the time uh, Robert Boyle was uh, foremost, one of the foremost chemists of his day. Uh, he's often identified as the first chemist, um, partly because he performed quantitative experiments. That is, he measured things and, and applied numbers and units of measure to what he did. So he had, he had uh, data to go with it hard numbers to back up his uh, laws. In fact, he developed the first experimental definition of an element. So it was sort of a transition between alchemy and modern chemistry. There was still some alchemical influences uh, into the 18th century. So remember we drew the, the difference between laws and theories. Uh, generally speaking, laws come first because um, we're just explaining how things happen. And it takes a little more effort and a lot more information and experimentation to turn a law into, not turn it into, but um, to fit a law into a theory. Or sometimes you may take several laws that fit into a theory. And then the theory explains why the law works. So one of those first laws was developed by um, a Frenchman. His name was Lavoisier. And um, uh, he did quantitative experiments, you know, along the lines of Robert Boyle. Um, but his law of uh, conservation of mass still holds today. It, it, it hasn't gone away. During a chemical reaction, when you're changing one substance to another, or you're reacting two or more substances together to get a new substance, um, mass is the same after as before. So you don't create matter, you don't destroy matter. Now with the, with the instruments that most of us have to measure mass, that law is still rock solid. We now know that uh, because of Albert Einstein and his famous equation, energy equals mass times speed of light squared, we know that matter and energy are interchangeable. So during a chemical reaction, if you've got energy being released, that means that some of that matter is being converted into energy. Um, I had to qualify that statement. Maybe some of the matter is converted into energy, but there's always energy locked up in bonds, chemical bonds. So that could be the source of the energy. There are two possible sources and I'm not trying to muddy the waters, but um, that's a fact. The law of conservation of mass Matter's not destroyed, not created during a chemical reaction. Then along came Proust. Um, and we're, we're adding information to our encyclopedia of knowledge. And this one says that um, a compound, which is a combination of two or more elements, always has the same proportion of elements. Once you've identified the compound as that pure substance, then no matter where it comes from, no matter what the source, that compound will always have the same ratio of mass of each of the elements, okay? Uh, example, let's suppose we have um, Suppose we take uh, methane 
It has one carbon, four hydrogens attached to each other, and we react it with oxygen. That's a combustion. And we get carbon dioxide and water. Okay. So we're going to focus on the water here. Now, this equation is not balanced. Right? We'll, we'll take care of balancing equations later. But this produces water. Okay? You can get water another way. How about you um, react hydrogen and oxygen, and you get water. Right? Those are chemical reactions. And they produce, as, as a product, water. Now, once you've got that water from the reaction, you don't know where it came from. It could have come from either one. I mean, unless you know exactly where it was produced, what it was produced from. And Proust says that this compound, this water molecule, this water compound, has the same ratio of oxygen to hydrogen by mass, no matter where it comes from. That's the law of definite proportions. The proportions of the elements are definite. They're not changeable as long as you've got the same compound. Now here's one that, that Dalton de devised, and it's often confused with the law of definite proportions. This is the law of multiple proportions. And it sort of piggybacks on the definite proportions. In fact, chronologically, it came after. In fact, we are in chronological order still with all of these laws. So what Dalton said was the law of multiple proportions. And notice that all of these laws are referencing masses of elements and compounds. At this time, there was no knowledge of the actual inside of a compound, that is, how the atoms interact and, and, and combine. All they knew at this time was mass ratios. So Dalton said that when you have a series of compounds of two elements, uh, for instance, and I'm going to Dalton wouldn't have put it this way. He would have said that if you combine nitrogen and oxygen together and you get different compounds, then the ratio of those compounds, uh, if you hold one of them constant, and here we say one gram of the first element, say we hold this one constant, then if you have one here and something here, then hold that one constant there, one there. The next time it combines with oxygen in a different compound, it might be twice as much. So this is one multiple, this is two multiples, this is three multiples of the mass of oxygen ratioed to that nitrogen. Does that make sense? Uh, maybe I need to explain it a different way. If you hold the mass of the nitrogen constant, as you sequence through the different compounds, then the one that you're allowed to vary varies by whole number of multiples. We know now that the reason for that is that this would be that, that, and that. Right? Dalton didn't know that. Scientists at his in, in his day and time didn't know that. They just knew that the ratios were whole number multiples. That's the law of multiple proportions. When you're comparing a series of compounds made with two of the same elements. Okay. Sometimes we refer to this as a homologous series. Homo meaning same. You got the same elements in each compound, but they change in the series by whole number multiples. Okay. We're going to stick with Dalton for a little while. Wow. Dalton was an Englishman, and he was, he was doing most of his work toward the end of the 18th century and into the 19th century. And uh, he devised, he actually, he took all these laws together, these and others, 
and he combined them into what he thought was actually causing these laws to function. Why do they work? Okay, so his theory, he started off actually borrowed from the ancient Greeks. And the ancient Greeks believed that all matter was made of an elemental particle called an atom. The Greeks thought that all atoms were alike. Every atom was the same, no matter what the substance was. So then they had to explain, well, if they all got the same atom, why are they different? You know, and so they had to do some mental gyrations to explain why that is. Well, Dalton made it a lot simpler. He said, okay, uh, all the elements are made up of tiny particles called atoms. I'll accept that from the ancient Greeks. But he said, the atoms of one element are different than the atoms of a different element. And now we write those as symbols. So the element of nitrogen will have one type of atom for nitrogen only. And if you look at oxygen, then it'll have a different type of atom. But still, the atom is the simplest part of that element. That's as small as you can get. If you take a, a bunch of an element, say, let's use gold. I like gold. If you split it, split it, split it, split it, and you keep subdividing it, eventually you end up with a single particle that can't be split any further by physical or chemical means. And that smallest particle is an atom. Okay? And the atom of gold is different than the atom of silver or the atom of hydrogen. Okay, so those are the two first premises of Dalton's theory. He didn't know how they were different yet. He just knew and he introduced the idea that these atoms were different. Right? He didn't know about subatomic particles yet. It was too early for that. What he did say was that when you get chemical compounds being formed, they're formed simply by rearranging atoms. We write those in a, in a chemical equation now. So when I had methane and oxygen on one side, then during the chemical reaction, they spit out the other side. You still got carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen on the other side. They're just arranged differently. So that was another one of Dalton's breakthroughs in explaining why things happen the way they do. Oh, and on top of that, the rearrangement of these atoms means that when you have a compound, either, either as a reactant or a product, that compound, no matter where it comes from, will always have the same relative numbers and types of atoms. Okay, now he's explaining the law of multiple proportions, which was was his idea originally, see? It's always good when you can explain your own laws with a theory. Okay, so these chemical reactions uh, cause the rearrangement of atoms and the way that they're bound together the atoms themselves do not change. Okay. So Dalton proposed this theory, and that's as far as it went, and people started using it to try to explain how things happen. Then we're... Um, these two fellows, uh, Guy Lussac and uh, Avogadro, um, worked primarily with gases as Robert Boyle was worked with gases and when we get to our discussion of gases I'll explain why that is um, but uh, Guy Lussac said uh, if you hold the temperature and the pressure same constant um, the reactions of gases can be measured and they can be related to 
the react the gaseous products that come out the other side as rea as products. So um, he was trying to relate the ratios of elements that combine into compounds relative to the volumes that they occupy. But that presented a problem because they weren't always uh, like say one volume of this, one volume of that gives you two volumes over here. Sometimes one plus one equals one, right? Or two plus two equals three. <clears throat> so um, he was more on the, on the order of gathering information. It was Avogadro that, that explained um, for, uh, that tried to make sense of and offered a, a uh, theory of why these things behave the way they do. They were still talking about gases. Okay, so simply stated, let me draw a picture. I'm going to draw a circle, but think of it as a sphere, right? Because gases are three dimensionals and I need a, a sphere to hold the gas. So we have a sphere here. And we have another one over here. They're supposed to be the same volume. Okay. So volume one equals volume two. All right. Temperature one equals temperature two. So far, so good. Same volume, same temperature, same pressure. And the pressure of this one equals the pressure of that. Let me see. Did somebody else pop in? I'm only missing one person. But I don't see him yet. Okay. So what Avogadro says is that if a gas is confined in equal volumes in separate cylinders, same temperature, same pressure, then that cylinder has the same number of particles in it as that cylinder. We now call them molecules. The same number of molecules in here equals the same number in there. And I abbreviate that with a small n. That was Avogadro's breakthrough. He didn't explain himself very well when he published his works. So it took someone else to look at his information and understand it and explain it better. Um, let's see, do I want to do this first? Okay, these were Gila Sachs experiments. Sometimes he combined two volumes of hydrogen, one volume of oxygen, he ended up with two volumes of gaseous water. Right, so two plus one equals two. So chemistry math is not doesn't work <laughs> like uh, you would expect. <laughs> now sometimes you can combine a volume of hydrogen and volume of chlorine in this case, and you get two volumes of hydrogen chloride. Now the explanation for the two plus one equals two is that these hydrogens are diatomic and the oxygen is diatomic. So when you get two volumes here and one volume there, the reason you get two volumes here is because you have two molecules. So um, that's our modern explanation for it. And the reason that hydrogen and chlorine react the way they do and give you one plus one equals two is that one volume of this See, these are single molecules, so that's one volume, one volume of that. And these are two volumes because you have two molecules separate. Gay-Lussac um, couldn't figure that one out. It took Avogadro to figure it, and then it took somebody else to come along and figure it. So I'm not going to, I'm going to stop right there and tell you about this person. Let's see, what was his first name? Uh, Stanislaw. I 
I think that's where you pronounce uh, spell it. Stanislaw Canizzaro. He was an Italian. He was not a very prominent chemist at the time. Um, in fact, he was he was active about the time that Avogadro died. Um, it, but he was a an instructor, a teacher. And I believe he was at the University of Genoa. And he was frustrated because he was teaching chemistry to students and um, he couldn't explain things very well and they weren't understanding things very well. So he went back to the drawing board and he found this work by Avogadro that explained um, that equal volumes have equal numbers of particles in them. And he saw the advantage to that. So what he did was he rewrote the curriculum for his chemistry classes using that as his basis. And he, uh, he printed up lots of copies, right, for his students and for other scientists. Okay, so about 1860, Europe was in turmoil. There were chemists everywhere in private laboratories, in universities, and working for companies, making products, and it was just a mess. Everybody was using different naming conventions. They were using different uh, mathematical expressions to say this turns into that. Um, there, was, there was no agreement across the discipline. So they got together. Um, I'm trying to think of who called the meeting. It escapes me right now. But they met in a place called um, Karlsruhe, Austria, I think. There was a university there. It was centrally located for everybody. And it probably had good food. It had a nice climate. And, you know, because scientists are not going to go to meetings if, unless they can relax at the same time. Anyway, they all met at this university for a week or so. And they had meetings, and usually the meetings just devolved into arguments, and they got off topic, and it just it was a mess. Well, Canizaro actually gave a talk at that meeting explaining what he thought was uh, accurate and true about things using Avogadro's theory. So he had lots of these copies of his his curriculum for his class. And uh, um, another scientist who agreed with him was handing them out, giving them to everybody. So they politely took their copies and they went back to their uh, universities, companies, private labs, wherever it happened to be. Some of them read them. Some of them agreed with them. Some of them didn't. You know, some, I mean, they probably felt like he was stepping on their uh, turf. And uh, he had no reputation, so they weren't going to pay him much mind. But some of them did. And eventually, his ideas spread across Europe. Even to the point where his ideas were credited by the um, creator of the periodic table. Um, brain freeze. Mendeleev, Dmitry Mendeleev, uh, brought together all this information into the first usable periodic table. And he credited Canizaro's work with helping him organize the elements in this table. Okay, so um, once chemists started um, using the information that was here and that this gas has the same number of particles as that gas, it didn't matter what the gas was. So if you have a gas that's got the same number of particles in each of the containers, but this one weighs more than that one, the only logical explanation is that these molecules in this container weigh more than these. So now you can start ratioing accurately the same number 
of molecules of each by comparison. And then that led to the uh, eventual understanding that some gases were not monatomic. Many gases were multiatomic, like hydrogen's diatomic H and diatomic chlorine, and those uh, elements that I wanted you to memorize as diatomic. But there are other gases, you know, like methane, that's it's not just a single element. So once they could ratio those masses of equal numbers of particles, they started to get a handle on the individual atomic masses. This atom weighs that much relative to this one. Then the light bulbs started going on all over Europe and they were fixing problems everywhere. Um, companies were making money. If something happened to their process, their engineers were able to fix it because they had a basic understanding an atomic level understanding of what was happening. Okay. Uh, so now we're going to start digging into the atom itself, right? Dalton said these, the atoms of different elements were different from one another. And that a combination of different atoms is what made compounds. So now we want to understand what makes an atom. Can we divide an atom any further? As a matter of fact, we can. And J.J. Thompson was one of the first ones. He was an Englishman who uh, postulated and then essentially proved that the negatively charged particles that were coming from some sources, um, atomic or physical sources, were uh, very small. I already said they were negatively charged, but they were very small. And the source of these electrons, we call them now, was from the atom. They were coming from atoms. And he actually determined the ratio of the charge to the mass of an electron. Turns out it's really small. The mass of an electron is extremely small. Um, but he also postulated that, well, we know that atoms, pure elements and atoms are neutral, right? Otherwise, they'd have a static charge. And all you'd have to do is touch one and get a shock. So they're neutral. Well, if they're neutral and the electron comes from atoms, there must be a balancing charge in there, a positive charge to offset that negative. And that's as far as he went with it. Uh, he did work with uh, what was called a cathode ray tube. It's just an evacuated glass tube with electrodes on either end. And uh, scientists all over Europe were still working with uh, electricity. Uh, it could come from several sources. Right? Benjamin Franklin uh, trapped some electricity from lightning, they say. Uh, but you could make batteries. They had what they called um, um, metallic piles. You get uh, disks of different metals, and you pile them together with an electrolyte between them. And then you pull off electrodes on either end, and you can get a pretty healthy shock from that. That's a battery. Well, they were using some of these sources, even they had mechanical sources of electricity too. And they were using, uh, some of them were using this cathode ray tube, which was partially evacu evacuated. And uh, they knew which direction the particles were moving, like the negatives were originating here and ending up over here. And they were using magnets and electric fields to bend the, the rays that went across uh, from one electrode to another. So they had a rudimentary understanding of which was negative and which was positive. Okay, so along comes an American, Robert Millikan. Uh, he was a college professor, and he invented this piece of equipment that he used to um, determine the mass of an electron. 
and he performed this experiment thousands of times over and over and over again ad nauseum and eventually he felt confident enough to publish his work and he he said that the um, mass of an electron in uh, based on the fundamental unit kilogram was a certain value now this is a this is a value is that we've determined this is a modern value but his was pretty close to that very close he calculated the mass and I think there may be a picture of the of the device uh, I don't know if the video is going to show or not no it's not sorry this is an old slide set and I think the fact that um, let's see what is it um, that just was retired not Java flash um, flash was just retired right so anything that you have in your <laughs> in your slides <laughs> that's based on flash technology won't work anymore um, let's see that was a pretty good explanation but basically what happened was he would take this evacuated cylinder and it had a glass in it and he had a telescope and there's your eye and you would look through this telescope and you could see uh, little oil drops well he had a mister up here so the oil would make very fine drops up here and they would fall through a hole right here in this electrode and there was another electrode down here right so um, this electrode was negative and this electrode was positive um, Yeah, but you also had to have a, a source of charge. You had to have a source of electrons. These electrodes were separate, and then you had a source here that would um, somehow add electrons, and they'd attach themselves to the oil drop. And as they fell through the hole, you could watch them fall, and there was a calibrated grid across the back, so you know how fast they were falling. And you could use some calculations and the you knew the charge on your plates and eventually uh, you could say all right this oil drop has that many electrons on it because this one is exactly half of that and this one is exactly one fiftieth of that and the smallest multiple he could find told tell him that that one had one electron on it And then that's what how he calculated the by the movement in this field of the oil drop. You could relate that to the mass of the electron. Okay. So now we know exactly how much an electron weighs. Um but there was more to it than that, right? There had to be a positive something or other to counteract that. So now we call that the proton. But in the interim, we were also looking at other things that were coming out of the atom. Um, the electron wasn't, wasn't part of the mass holding the most of the mass of the atom wasn't the electron because it was so light. So we knew something had to be really heavy in there uh, to account for the mass of the individual atoms. And that's where a study of radioactivity comes in. Radioactive elements emit um, a number of different types of uh, radiation. Um, the gamma rays, they're nothing but high energy light. They're photons, right? So um, that's not the source. Beta particles, 
they're negatively charged and they're just moving really fast. It turns out the beta particle is just a, a fast electron, but the electron comes from the nucleus of the atom. The alpha particles, however, they are uh, positively charged ions coming from radioactive elements. Uh, and we've identified them as helium nuclei. So they've got two protons, two neutrons, and no electrons. So since they're two protons, that means there's two positive charges. And no electrons means uh, there's nothing to balance their charge. So those are the main types of uh, radiation. And uh, Henry Becquerel, among others, studied these phenomena. So there were um, there was one theory. Uh, let's see, called um, the plum pudding model. of the atom and in this model it was like a big lump of plum pudding with positive charges here and here and here and here and negative charges there 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 see i need one more to balance them they were just all meshed together um but there were some scientists who didn't believe it and Ernest Rutherford was one of them. Ernest Rutherford was an Englishman, and he proposed that uh, the nuclear model of the atom. He said that there was a very dense nucleus in the middle where all of these protons were located, and then the electrons were out here. Okay? So if those electrons were out here, that means there was not much mass out there. Most nearly all of the mass of the atom was right here in the nucleus. Okay, so how do you differentiate between this one and that one? Well, Rutherford said, um, if I take these uh, alpha particles, you know, the helium nuclei, there's two plus charge. If I take that source an alpha particle source, and this is all shielding here, like lead shielding, just to be safe. And these uh, alpha particles are coming out of there, and then I say, okay, I'm going to collimate that beam. If you make that, those particles go through two aligned holes, then the ones coming out this side are gonna be straight. Right, because only the ones that are coming in straight from this side can make it all the way and straight out the other side. So now we have this beam of alpha particles. So what are we going to do with it? Well, Rutherford said, I'm going to fire it at an atom. And the only way he could be sure that he was firing at one or maybe two possible atoms was to have a very thin sheet of something pounded so thin that he had nearly almost one atom thick and gold was perfect because we knew how to work gold in, in these, these days. We knew that we could smash it and smash it and keep smashing it and it would just become so thin you could blow it away with a breath. That's the kind of stuff they put on the Capitol in Charleston. I mean, it looks nice and shiny, but there's not much there. <laughs> it's very thin. So he put this gold foil right there, and then he put his detectors around it, which probably would have been uh, photographic film. And he said, if the plum pudding model is right, then all of these alpha particles basically are going to go through and make a spot right there, right? Because there's no concentrated mass to deflect them. They're just going to go straight through. But he said, if my model is correct, then most of them will go through because the atom is largely empty space. But if one of these alpha particles hits the nucleus, which is extremely dense, 
then it's going to be deflected. Some of them might even be bounced back. And that's exactly what his detector showed. Most of it was here. A lot of it came out here and a few of them bounced straight back. So Rutherford proved with that experiment his nuclear model for the atom. And that explains why um, the atom behaves the way it does. It's got the positive charges in it. It's got the negative charges in it. And um, that was the very beginning of the explanation for why atoms interact with one another. What does an atom see when it comes close to another atom? It doesn't see the nucleus. It sees the electrons around the nucleus. So the interaction of those electrons is where the chemistry happens. Okay, I lost everybody. There's nobody's picture but me. Is everybody still there? Oh, okay, okay, good. <laughs> I felt alone for a minute. <clears throat> okay, so um, Rutherford had some students, and I'm trying to remember uh, the student that helped him work on another project. Um, shoot. Where did I put it? Nineteen eleven. Rutherford Thompson. There's Thompson. Rutherford. Okay. Rutherford. And where did he go? Chadwick. He had a, a graduate student or a lab assistant, I can't remember which, named Chadwick, that helped him work on another project because <clears throat> um, attributing the mass of an atom to the protons, sometimes that wasn't enough. There's more mass than you could account for with the proton because at this time we had also determined the mass of a proton. So if you add up all the protons and you know the atomic mass of the element by other means, sometimes they didn't jive, they didn't match. So maybe there's another particle in there, right, that doesn't have a charge, but it has a lot of mass too. And that's what uh, I think it was Chadwick that worked on that one and proved that the, the rest of the mass of the atom was contained in another subatomic particle called the neutron. And the neutron is roughly the same mass as the proton, just a hair heavier, but no charge. Okay, and with these three particles, we can account for all of the mass of an atom, plus its charge. Okay, so this is a, sort of a, a scale representation, scaled down, actually a scaled up, <laughs> representation of a, an atom uh, and the nucleus is say if the nucleus were 10 to the minus 13 centimeters the size of the atom was 10 to the minus 8 so there's a five order magnitude difference between the nucleus size and the atom size so there's lots of empty space in here and that's why you can take uh, if you increase the pressure enough you can take a, a sample of element and squeeze it down to almost nothing. And that's what happens in some stars. Okay, so now the neutron gave us uh, the tool for explaining differences in various collections of atoms. Call them isotopes. So, what's an isotope? Well, first we have to realize that when we have, uh, let me see, let me pick, uh, 
Let's use sodium. So if we have sodium, we know that sodium, no matter where it comes from, we identify the number of protons in sodium, and it turns out to be 11. Did I show you that one before, the, the convention, the four points on a symbol? I'll refresh your memory. These are the number of protons. This is the, and this is uh, also abbreviated a, a Z. That's the Z number. The A number is the mass number. And it's the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Hope that's not too small. Over here you have the number of atoms. So if there's no number there, it's understood to be one, right? Because if you got the symbol, you've got at least one atom. And then up here is charge. So every element has a different number of protons. That's what defines the element, the number of protons. And of course, if it's neutral, you have the same number of electrons. So you've got the number of protons here for sodium. So any isotope of sodium is going to have 11 protons. But this number can be different for the two isotopes of sodium because of the number of neutrons. If you change the number of neutrons, then you have a different isotope as long as you keep the number of protons the same, then you have an isotope of that element. And sodium, let's see. Um, the most common isotope of sodium has 23 atomic number. So how many neutrons does that mean? Well, 11 from 23, because that's the protons. So what's left over is the neutrons. So that would be uh, 12, right? 12 neutrons. But you can also have 11 neutrons, which means that this number would be 22 rather than 23. Okay? So that explains, on your periodic chart, you've got, um, now there's a difference between the mass number, which is a whole number addition of protons and neutrons, and the atomic mass. The atomic mass is a weighted average of the natural abundance of all these different isotopes. So that's why the atomic mass that's in your periodic table is always fractional. It's a whole number point something. Okay, It's a weighted average. Because most of the elements are predominantly one isotope. And then there are minor occurrences of, of different isotopes that skew the average a little bit to one side or the other, either larger or smaller. Okay, so uh, every atom of a pure element has the same number of protons every time they can have different numbers of neutrons. And if they're neutral, they have the same number of electrons as protons. So while we're on the topic, how do you make an ion? Like sodium typically tries to do this when it's reacting with an element. Say a table salt would be sodium chloride. So the electron went from here to here. The only way that you can make an ion and, and keep the same element is with electrons. Because if you change the positive charges, you've changed the number of protons and you've changed the element. So in order to keep that symbol and make an ion, you've got to do it with electrons. So if you take away an electron, you have an imbalance of one positive charge. 
If you add an electron, you have an imbalance of one negative charge. Okay, that's how you make ions. Uh, okay, so there's your sodium. Um, I guess wrong. Well, actually, you do have sodium with 11 neutrons, but you also have sodium, sodium with 13 neutrons. There's no law that says you can only have two isotopes. Uh, some elements, uh, particularly some of the radioactive elements, have a dozen or more. Well, lots of elements have large numbers of isotopes. But they're, so, they're such minor components, they have little influence on the outcome, the weighted average. Okay. All right, here's the slide I was looking for. So these positions around the symbol are reserved for certain information. Now, when we're writing chemical reactions, uh, we usually don't care about the isotopes. So when we're writing the symbol and uh, representing a chemical reaction, we're really only interested in, this, where's my pointer, only at this position with the charge and this position with the number of atoms. Only when we're talking about nuclear effects are we interested in A and Z. Okay. All right, so let's see if we can do a little detective work. Uh, we have a certain isotope X that contains 23 protons and 28 neutrons. So what I like to do when I'm given a problem is to extract information from the problem and put it on the board or my piece of paper separate from the problem because word problems invariably are created to confuse. They're designed to confuse the student or the test taker so that only the ones who really know what they're doing can answer the question. So in order to do that, I extract information from the problem. So we've got an isotope X, and it says 23 protons. So I know where to put that, right there. But it's also got 28 neutrons. So we've got 28 neutrons, all right? So together, that makes 51 mass number, right? Add them together. Okay, now that's given information. What's the question, right? You got to know the question, you can't get the answer. What's the mass number of this isotope? Oh, I already did it, 51. What's the identity of the element? So what's the, the surest fire way to find the identity of an element? If you know the protons, it's easy. You just go to your periodic table. It's numbered from left to right, top to bottom, in sequence, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, on across and down. So you just find out 51. Where's 51? Well, let's see. There's 20. Uh, nope, not there. Maybe it's on this row. Ah, there it is. 51 is SB. What the hell is SB, right? <laughs> antimony. SB is antimony. So we write SB 23. That's kind of redundant, actually. The element and the number of protons, if you know one, you know the other. Excuse me, sir? Uh-oh. Uh -oh. I did wrong. I looked at the wrong number, didn't I? Is that what you were going to catch me on? Oh, uh, yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to say... I would like to say that I did it on purpose to see if you would catch me, but I can't claim that. It happens. So 23 on your periodic table is vanadium. I was looking up the wrong number, wasn't I? Okay. 23 says vanadium, and then 51 is the mass number for that isotope. If we look at vanadium, let's see. Here it is. The uh, atomic mass, the average weighted average is 50.94. So we can make a, a qualitative assessment 
50.94 means what? It means most of the isotopes are probably 51. And then what's the next most abundant isotope? Probably 50. Smaller amount because it's bringing the average down away from 51 rather than above 51. Okay. Most of the time, my students just sit there and let me go on. And I'll, I'll figure it out maybe later and come back and make the correction. I'm, I'm glad you're keeping me on my toes. Okay. Um, so we've talked about compounds and how they're formed and the ratios of uh, the definite ratios of the mass by mass. Um, but what holds a compound together? Well, there are two types of bonds, predominantly, that hold compounds together. Um, the first one we'll talk about is the covalent bond. Covalent is another word, is a chemical word for sharing, right? When these atoms come together, they see electrons, right? That's the first thing they see. So if the conditions are right, they share the electrons. They spend part of their time over here and part of their time over there. And that sharing, that mutual cooperation by sharing electrons forms a bond. And when they do that, they form a unit that behaves, they form a, an association that behaves as a single unit. Uh, water's a good example, where you get uh, oxygen bound to hydrogen And that molecule behaves as a single unit, and it actually has a, an, a distinct identity that's different from the elements of which it's made. Hydrogen and oxygen are both gases at uh, a room temperature and one atmosphere of pressure, but water is a liquid. So they have different phases. They have different behaviors, too. And... That's the definition of a molecule. It's bound by covalent bonds, and it behaves as a single unit. All right, I wish I could show you this, but what's happening here is the chlorine atoms are approaching one another, and they share electrons between. And they produce the diatomic molecule of chlorine. And, and that's one of those diatomics like hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, uh, bromine, iodine. Those are all diatomics. So you can substitute any one of those in here and uh, present the same argument. The other possibility is ionic bonding. Ionic bonding uh, occurs when two elements approach each other and one of them has a, such a strong attraction for electrons, it takes electrons, one or more electrons, from the other element. Okay. Now that the electrons reside in excess on this side and they're absent on that side, you produce a negative charge over here and a positive charge over here, and they attract. That's an ionic bond. Typically, you get ionic bonds from elements that are very far apart, left to right. Like if you have something over here, bonding with something over here, you're definitely going to get an ionic bond. As they get closer together, the covalent nature starts to accumulate. Um, so typically, anything over here and anything over there will form an ionic bond. Because the ones on the right-hand side attract electrons, and the ones on the left-hand side are just happy to give them up. So that's what happens when sodium approaches chlorine. Right? An electron is transferred. So now you get a negative charge, a positive charge, and a bond. Uh, an electrostatic attraction, an ionic, ionic bond. The difference between ionic and covalent in this argument is that this does not form a single 
unit that behaves as a single unit. What it forms is a, uh, a crystal network. So this sodium will be surrounded by chloride ions. Oops. And sodium ions close to the others. So they form a network like that. Okay, in three dimensions. And you can see the shape of that network, right? All you have to do is spill some salt on a table and, and get your magnifying glass out and look at it. What's the shape of a grain of salt? It's a cube, right? So these forms, these uh, sodium ions and chloride ions form a cubic network. Um, when we write it like this, That's the simplest ratio of positive ions to negative ions. This is called a cation. It's positive. And this is called an anion. It's negative. Right? That's the simplest ratio. So in that cube of salt, you'll have an equal number of sodium ions and chloride ions. But they don't behave as a single unit not like molecules do. Okay, uh, this probably tried to explain the difference between molecular and ionic compounds. So we got another detective story. Let's see, how am I doing on time? 312, 3.45, okay, I got about a half hour left. So we probably are going to split this up and come back on our on uh, Tuesday and finish up chapter two. Okay, so a certain isotope has um, it's a singly charged cation, one positive charge. Right, it contains fifty four electrons and seventy eight neutrons. Okay, how can we deduce the mass number of that isotope? Well, we know the neutrons, so we got to find out how many protons there are, right? So what do we know about ions? The charge is based solely upon addition or subtraction of electrons. So if we have 54 electrons, but it's positively charged, that means it has one extra proton, doesn't it? So it's got 55 protons. 55 positives against 54 negatives gives you one positive. So the uh, Z number should be 55. And that means the mass number would be uh, 133, right? Now, what element is that? I'll do it right this time. Uh, 55 protons. Let me see here, 55. Okay, I've got cesium, CS. So we would write it this way. Okay. Oh, that wasn't one of the questions, but I did that extra. That's a freebie. <clears throat> okay, knowing what we know now, let's look back at Dalton's atomic theory and see which parts of it are still true. Right? Let's see. Elements are made of tiny particles called atoms. Is that true? Yeah, still true. Right? That hadn't changed. Um, all atoms of a given element are identical. A given, sometimes it helps to read statements and questions backwards. So we're looking for identical. And if we're in an element, that means that it's pure, right? 
all atoms would be the same. They're identical. Uh, wait a minute. Maybe they're not. What do we mean by identical? Each one has the same mass, perhaps? That's not true anymore, is it? Because of isotopes. Right? So all the atoms of a given element are not identical because they could be isotopes with different numbers of neutrons. Let's see, a given compound always has the same relative number and types of atoms. That's true. That hasn't changed. Atoms are indestructible. Well, we know that's not true, <laughs> right? Some atoms fly apart on their own. We call it radioactivity. All right, so these two are still true. Two and four uh, are not are no longer true uh, because of what we know about the structure of the nucleus. Okay, um, yeah, we got time to talk about the periodic table. Uh, let me get out my hard copy so I can see what's coming because I want to stop at a convenient place. Um, okay. So, the periodic table. How is it organized? And this, um, the extra credit that you can do for using the periodic table um, will help you understanding this. Periodic table, uh, it didn't always look this way. It looks this way now because of certain basic information that you don't have yet. So let's just learn the overall structure first. Um, we can group the periodic table into two sides. The left-hand side from about here over, they're all metals, right? Then they have those characteristics of metals that we expect, right? If you, if you um, have a chunk of metal and you, you slice it smooth and maybe polish it, it'll, it'll have a luster to it. Um, it'll also conduct heat and conduct electricity very well. On this side, we have, oh, and it's malleable, right? You can smash it. You can bend it. Um, you can stretch it. Duct, it's ductile. Stretch it into thin wires. Um, on this side, we have nonmetals. Nonmetals typically are dull in color. Um, they're brittle, right? Um, but they're often very hard as well. Uh, some of them, and the metals over here, most of them are solids, except for one. You know which one that is? Mercury. At room temperature, mercury is a liquid. And there's one uh, gallium here that's a solid until you put it in your hand. It has a very low melting point. So you put some gallium in your hand and it'll turn into a puddle. But um, the nonmetals can be any phase. They can be solids, liquids, or gases. Uh, we have lots of gases, right? The noble gases. We have uh, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. Uh, chlorine, they're all gases, but we have um, liquid, bromine is a liquid, but iodine is a solid. It's in the same family, but different phase. Um, and then there's a dividing line that you'll see, uh, hopefully, and it's kind of a stair step, starting here with boron, underneath boron, and then it goes over one and goes down next between aluminum and silicon. And then it steps over again and goes between germanium and, and uh, arsenic. And then it steps over again and, and runs between antimony and tellurium. And it steps over again and runs between uh, polonium and astatine. That's the dividing line between nonmetals and metals. Now, um, several of these elements that are right on that dividing line we call them metalloids because under certain circumstances, they behave as metals. 
and under other circumstances they behave as nonmetals. And this region right in here is the foundation of our um, electronics industry. This is where you get semiconductors. Okay, we'll not will not beat that horse anymore. But okay, so another other divisions of the table, right? We can have uh, groups or families. They used to call them families. Now they call them groups. They're vertical on this version of the periodic chart. So these elements are in that family. These are in that family. Those are in that family, right? And they're in that family because they have similar characteristics, physical and chemical characteristics. They're not identical, right? But they're similar. They're like, like a family, right? Um, I bear a closer resemblance to my father than my brother does, right? But we're similar. Um, then from left to right, we have periods, right? Uh, the reason we call them periods is we have, if we start here at this period, this family with potassium, and then we step our way across, then we get to uh, Krypton. And if we go another step beyond, we find an element that's a lot like potassium that we left behind. So we wrap around and start a new period. It's periodic. This, this thing happens over and over and over again. So we go to that end, oh, we gotta turn around and go back. Uh, we go to that, I gotta turn around and go back. So that's a period. Uh, if any of you have had physics and studied periodic motion, periodic motion is that type of motion that goes through a cycle and the object moves somewhere and comes back to the same location, starts over again. It's like a swing pendulum is a type of periodic motion. So we have a periodic movement in the chart that we start over again and then we start over again. Okay, those are periods. Uh, and this is, okay, this is probably a better representation than the one I was holding in my hand. Uh, easier to see anyway. So there's our dividing line between nonmetals and metals here. Then we have uh, groups, and these groups have names, some of them, right? This first group here on the left is called alkali metals. The next group over is the alkaline earths, or the alkaline earth metals. Then we go back over to the right-hand side. These are all noble gases, right? They don't form compounds with anybody unless you know, we've been ma we've managed to force them to do it, but typically they don't they don't like to react. Uh, then these are the halogens right here. Um, the ones with oxygen in them that start with oxygen and go down, those are the calcogens, C H A C O G E N, calcogens. Then the ones that starts with nitrogen are the nicogens. P N I C T O G E N S. Okay. Um, carbon group doesn't have a name. Boron group doesn't have a name. This group right in here, all of these together are called transition metals. We're transitioning from these metals to these metals and non metals. So it stands to reason. Um, this group down here is actually uh, not vertical. These are the lanthanides. You take this whole group right here, left to right, and you stick it right in this crack between lanthanum and hafnium right there. So it was brought out to keep the periodic table from being <laughs> as broad as the wall. And then the actinides, similarly, they go right in here between actinium and rutherfordium right there. Now, we're going to look at the periodic table again later in more detail and why the arrangement is like it is. And it'll make a whole lot more sense. And actually the periodic table will, be, will become more useful when we start talking about electronic structure of elements. Then um, later on in the semester, uh, it'll become obvious why these things are arranged the way they are. 
So um, when uh, some of these groups prefer a certain charge, particularly if they're metals and they're reacting with nonmetals or nonmetals reacting with metals, the alkali metal group, the first one, prefers a plus one charge. And the alkaline earths, right next door, prefers a plus two charge. The halogens, when they react, they prefer a minus one charge. Right. So let's go back. Uh, so these prefer minus one. These prefer plus one, plus two. These prefer minus two. And these prefer minus three. When they react with a metal, when they react with one of their neighbors, then you get covalent bonding. But when you talk about ionic bonding, that's what they prefer. Okay, next we're gonna we're gonna pick up naming compounds next Tuesday. How about that? This will be a good dividing place. And you can start working on that periodic table. Uh, let me make myself a note so I'll pick it up where we left off. Here we go. And this will be on. What, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. I've got. No, this is Wednesday. What am I thinking of? Monday. I'm sorry. Wednesday's today. <laughs> we'll, we'll pick it up on Monday. So Monday would be the first. Yeah, February 1st. Okay. I'm not trying to rush you out, but I need a bathroom break. So we've got 15 minutes left. I'll tell you what, if you're still here when I get back, I'll answer any questions, but you're free to go if you want. And I'll come back at um, 345 and uh, on my personal ID, if you have any lab questions, okay? Just like we did last week, uh, it's not mandatory, you know, just pop in and I'll be here at 345.